Hi everyone, Stepan here. In today's middle game video, I'm going to talk about uh, how to attack the king in the center or an uncastled king. Now, while leaving your king in the center isn't always a mistake, very often it could give your opponent attacking chances and chances for him to disrupt your castling in the future. So be careful when when doing that, of course. Uh, before I start, I would just like to say thank you for the support and the kind comments and everything. Uh, so, the king in the center. Most often, if you follow the classical chess principles, uh, you are going to be okay in the early middle game. If you neglect them, you can get in trouble. So what are the chess principles according to classical chess, not hypermodern chess? So firstly, uh, if we go to the opening, uh, this was uh, a Sicilian knight of e4, c5, knight f3, d6, d4. What white is doing, he is taking the center, trying to gain central control, at the same time trying to develop his minor pieces, using the rule of developing his knights before his bishops. And then castling. So c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight to c3, white is developing his knights, a6, bishop to g5, developing another minor, minor piece, knight bd7, bishop c4. You can see that white is, after e6 castles, uh, been following uh, the most sensible way to play chess. And now white is fine, and white, even though he might be a 1500 player or 1200 player and his opponent is a grandmaster, he can be sure that he won't get checkmated in the next 10 moves because it's practically impossible. So this is what classical chess gives you. On the other hand, black is playing the Sicilian defense, the knight of variation, and this is still theory, by the way, so he can't really uh, play uh, by the book as white can because the Sicilian is a very aggressive opening and uh, with the Sicilian, black tries to get attacking chances instead of uh, bringing his king to safety early on. So in this position, and I wanted to use this game between Keres and Saitar as the first example, uh, Saitar probably didn't know the theory of the Sicilian, and in this position, you basically have to either play queen to a5, queen to b6, or h6. Black's king is now in the center, and he's... Um, at least two moves away from castling. So bishop e7 and castles would be the desired moves in the next five moves. And after that, black is fine. So what white wants to do now is, if possible, use the chances to disrupt to disrupt uh, black from castling in the future or to use the fact that his, his king is in the center now. So how do you play against the king, king in the center? Uh, the king in the center is like a target uh, you can aim at. And... When your opponent's king is in the center, nothing else really matters. The only thing that matters apart from your opponent's king being in the center is your own king. So if you don't get checkmated, material doesn't matter, time doesn't matter, pawn structure doesn't matter. You can give up three pieces and ruin your entire pawn structure if you manage to checkmate your opponent's king. It doesn't really matter. So this... Uh, isn't something only weaker players will will allow. You won't see every grandmaster having his king castled on move 10. Uh, this player, uh, Jaroslav Saitar, is of course a very strong player. This was the 1954 Olympiad played in Amsterdam. Paul Keres was stronger, but Saitar wasn't a bad player. And he's playing theory, so leaving the king in the center is a normal thing. Now, if black plays normal moves like queen a5 or h6, let's say h6, queen h4, queen b6, bishop b3, this is a normal knight of, this has been played many times and in 2700 games. So this is normal theory, but in their game, Saitar played queen to c7. And this is the first point I would like to make. When you're playing against an uncastled king, you need to be prepared to consider every move as, the, as if the position were critical. So every move your opponent makes, uh, try to think of the position as being game-changing and your next move decisive. Because very often, you are going to have opportunities uh, for a great attack or a sacrifice or a chance to open up the position if you look closely enough. So now, uh, moves that come to mind are only the moves which open up the position and bring you closer to the Black King. You shouldn't really worry about prophylaxis. Uh, in this case, you shouldn't really worry about development. You need to bring your pieces into the attack later, but your main goal, if possible, is to open up the Black King and attack. So, moves that I would look at here are definitely pawn to e5, trying to open some lines, but then after d5, I'm not sure that works. And then I would look at the thematic Sicilian sacrifices. In the Sicilian Nidorf, uh, sacrifices on e6 are very thematic and they occur often, especially if 
black is not careful. So now uh, the move queen to c7 made this even worse. If queen to b6 was played, which is a normal move, uh, the sacrifices still could work, but not as well. So after queen to b6, bishop takes c6 could still be played, f takes c6, knight takes c6. The difference is that the knight is no longer attacking the queen. So after knight c5, which would be the best move, knight takes f8, king takes f8. If you count the material, white has two minor pieces, white has given up a knight for two pawns and... White is better because black is going to have a hard time developing this rook and he's going to have uh, a hard time defending with his king in the center, but the sacrifice is not deadly. That's why queen to b6 can be played even though it's not one of the best moves. But after queen to c7, this sacrifice uses the fact that the king is in the center perfectly in conjunction with the weak queen as a tempo gainer on queen seven on, on c7. So bishop takes c6, now works perfectly. F takes c6, knight takes c6, now attacking the queen. Queen to c4, the queen has to move. So, I mean, after queen to c4, knight d5 is begging to be played. And this is stage two. Uh, you removed one of the defenders. If your opponent's king is in the center, you want to open up the position, bring as many of your attackers uh, towards the king and remove as many defenders as possible. So queen to c4 is, well, chasing the queen away and giving uh, away the d5 square, so queen d5. Now threatening knight to c7, perhaps king to f7, bishop takes f6, opening up lines, king takes c6, bishop to c3. Knight to f6, bishop takes f6, g takes f6, knight to b6, attacking the queen, attacking the rook. And now I don't want to go any further. This position is obviously just lost for black and there is nothing he can do. The point is that you need to spot opportunities like this one. If you play uh, against the Sicilian, you are going to face the knight very often. Now in this position, if after queen to c7 you play something normal, uh, I don't know, you your bishop is attacked, so you retreat the bishop. Black can play h6, bishop h4, queen to b6. There's nothing in the position for white. White is slightly better as in every Sicilian. So the most important thing is that you spot your opportunities. After queen to c7, you have one chance. If you don't use it now, then the opportunity is gone. Playing against an uncastled king is very tactical play. Uh, you shouldn't really worry about strategic plans or positional play or anything else. You need to be tactically strong and... I think that the easiest way to utilize your opportunity with your uh, the opportunity of your opponent having an uncastled king is to ask yourself whether something is there. Is there anything in this position? After queen to c7, if you are familiar with uh, the patterns in the knight of Sicilian, then you are going to be looking at something takes e6 automatically. But you should be able to uh, spot opportunities like this one, even if you don't play the opening or if it occurs outside of uh, the book. So, okay, uh, the second example is slightly less obvious and it's not theoretical. And this is why I chose this, chose this example. Uh, this is David Navara, the best Czech grandmaster against Mircea Emilian Par Parliglas. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. It was played in the uh, European Individual Championship 2015. And now... In this position, white could already castle, of course, but uh, David Navarra spotted an opportunity which he used immediately. And this is, I think, one of the best moves, even though the engines disagree. Queen to c2. Queen to c2 gives up uh, a portion of white's advantage, but it's, it, clears, it serves a clear purpose, uh, preventing black from castling. Of course, if black now castles, then bishop takes check and, I mean, the position is winning for white. So after queen to c2, black can't castle. So black now played g6, trying to castle normally, and now David Navarra, uh, as I mean, what I was talking about in the last example isn't as obvious here. He can't really sacrifice anything yet. He can't really open up the position uh, in any very aggressive way, but he still has a, uh, has a move which is uh, immensely uncomfortable for, for black and which sort of disrupts castling, and that's the move e6. So I think that in any normal situation, he wouldn't play this move, he wouldn't play this pawn sacrifice. But since he saw that the black king is going to be left in the center after bishop h6, that move is more than justified. The engines don't really agree with the move, and they think white should be doing something else. But from a human perspective, this king, which now has only one square to go to if attacked, is almost completely dead. Uh, black here played bishop f6, trying to defend, and now another move by David Navarra, which the engine completely disagrees with. The engine want wants to castle short, 
And this is objectively the best move, probably, because you're not allowing any chances to, to black. But after bishop f6, David Navarra played castle long. And if you turned on the engine now, uh, the engine thinks black is better. But that's completely ridiculous. I mean, if you asked 100 people which side would they rather have, I'm not sure anybody would say black, because it's really hard to play. Okay, so now the king can't castle for at least three moves, so you have to move the queen, you either have to move the knight or the b-pawn, you have to move the bishop, and then you have to castle uh, long. Castling short is not available at the moment, the bishop is guarding f8. So part one complete. Uh, Navarra is now sure that the king is going to be left in the center. He has all of his pieces ready to come into the game, and all of his pieces are perfect. Black played queen to e7. Probably wanting to castle and probably wanting to play bishop g7 even or something like that. Rook h2 e1. Stage 2 is bringing all of your pieces into play. Why would you play without your rook on h1? So that's very important. Obviously black doesn't really have ideal defenders. The rook on a8 and the bishop on c8 are out of the game. So it will help, help having extra pieces in play. If you can't find a winning move in situations like this one, where you have sacrificed something and Navarra only sacrificed a pawn, you don't really have to find a winning move. Just try to, try to bring as many pieces clo as close to your opponent's king as possible. Uh, in this position, the move knight c5 was played, uh, attacking the bishop. And now another mistake by Navarra according to the engines, but I think it's a wonderful move. g4, trying to open up the, the position some more, chase away the bishop. Bishop d7, trying to castle. And now uh, another key move, tempo gainer, g5, forcing the bishop to g7, which now doesn't allow uh, black to castle anymore, because if after bishop d7, g5, you castle, I'm going to take the bishop. So he doesn't let black castle. Bishop g7. Bishop takes g6, another move which doesn't let black castle, and now it's definite. Uh, in this position, you have to decide whether you are going all in for an attack, or whether you are going to allow black to castle, consolidate, and it's questionable whether you are better or not. You probably are, but not that much. And now, uh, tactics. Uh, once you take on g6, pawn takes g6, firstly you have queen takes g6 check, secondly you have rook takes d5, which is very important because the e, e, e6 pawn is pinned. So he saw that he is going to win three, three pawns for the piece, so bishop takes g6, h takes g6, queen takes g6 check, and then d5 is hanging. So bishop takes was played, sacrificing a piece, but this piece wasn't really in the attack, uh, with the g6 pawn. I mean, how do you get this piece to attack the king? This diagonal is closed, this diagonal is closed, so it's not helping in the attack. And if you manage to get your queen closer, which from c2 doesn't really do that much, if you manage to get the queen closer, and if you manage to open up the, the files for the rooks, then this bishop doesn't really matter. So bishop takes, h takes, queen takes check, king f8, rook d5. The pawn was pinned. Okay, uh, stage 2 complete, you managed to optimize all of your pieces, uh, black is still playing two defenders uh, down, basically this bishop is still out of play until it gets to c6. Uh, in this position, uh, his opponent played bishop takes h6, trying to get rid of some of the defenders, and now another wonderful move, once again using the fact that the pawn is pinned, rook f5, and uh, I mean... His opponent decided that it's best to, to, to give up the queen here, which was the best move, ef5. Rook takes e7, takes the queen, king e7, and now not taking the bishop with the pawn, of course, because the king doesn't have anywhere to go. Queen f6 check, king e8, queen takes h8, bishop f8, g6, and in a couple of moves his opponent resigned, even though Navarra only has a queen and the knight. Look at this, bishop e6, trying to defend, knight to g5, King e7, knight takes e6, bishop takes e6, g7. If you take with the bishop, I'll take the rook. Uh, he took on a2, and after c4, uh, after c4, uh, he resigned. And I mean, there, there's nothing you can do here. So, so white won the game. Coming back to to the crucial moments, I think that in this position, which doesn't seem like much, we, this is move eight. White is better. Black misplayed the English slightly, but it's 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 not over. It's not that bad. Queen to c2 is the key move. And this is following several plans. He's planning to castle queenside, and uh, he wants uh, to keep the king in the center. And this, even though the engines don't, don't like it, is a very aggressive way to play, and I think you should go for plans like this one. So after g6, e6, following up his plan, f takes e6, bishop h6, a pawn sacrifice to leave the king in the center, and then destroyed it nicely. Okay, uh, the next move... <clears throat> 
I'm sorry, the next game is Mikhail Tal versus Georgi Triginov, uh, played in the 1964 Interzonal. Of course, Triginov is not a weak player, he's playing in the Interzonal, so a grandmaster. And uh, yeah, coming back to the opening, it was the modern defense, uh, and Triginov went for this pawn after queen to d2, he took the sacrifice, um, queen takes b2, rook b1, queen a3, bishop c4, and this is only slightly better for white, of course white has compensation for the pawn, if you count the development, black has developed the queen and the bishop, white has developed two bishops, two knights, one rook and the queen, and he's just about to castle, so... The pawn doesn't really matter if black can use his, uh, if white can use his initiative uh, in time. Black here played que queen a5, moving the queen for the second time. I mean, it's really hard to do anything because you are going to have to move the queen uh, at some point anyway, because rook to b3 could come. White castled, so Mikhail Tal, even though he has the initiative, he has more pieces developed, the black king is stuck in the center, he doesn't go opening up lines before he optimizes all of his pieces. And one thing you have to keep in mind, if you're going for an all-out attack against your opponent's king, it's best to have, your king, to have your king castled. If your king is in the center, then your opponent might get counterplay, the position might get complicated, and that. Here... Uh, uh, Triginov played a very bad move, um, the best move is probably knight to d7, knight f6 is also playable, I think, developing anything and trying to castle is the best way to play, h6 is a good move, bishop f4, knight to d7, that's, that's a good line, but after castles he played e6, which is another time-wasting move, trying to prevent... Uh, white from cramping him down, uh, Tal played rook f to e1, another a uh, very good move, getting another piece into play. Now, all of white's pieces are optimal. All of white's pieces are on the best possible squares. And black is still playing with the bishop and the queen against all of this. a6, another pawn move which I don't really understand. I mean, he's obviously a strong player. He's playing in the, in the interzonal. But this is as if you were trying to find an example of bad play with the king in the center. And Mikhail Tal used it perfectly. In seven moves, the game was over. Bishop f4. Uh, this is a good move, attacking the pawn and trying to provoke the move e5. And uh, he fell for that. So e5, and now d takes e5, d takes e5, and the key move uh, for the attack, queen to d6. And this is the start of uh, an attack which is impossible to defend. Of course, Mikhail Tal left two pieces on pre. Black can take the bishop, black can take the knight. Uh, taking either loses, same as any other move. Uh, queen takes c3 was, was played. And now a very simple uh, combination, rook e to d1, uh, threatening checkmate on d8. Uh, you can't really do much, you can take the bishop, but you're getting checkmated. If you play knight to d7, which he did play, then bishop takes f7, king takes f7, knight to g5, king e8, queen to e6, and that's just it. Uh, the game is over after this check, you have a check here, and the game is lost, so this is a mate in two. But the key point is, uh, after queen to d2, uh, if you play the modern defense, then you know this, and you can take the pawn, I mean, after rook to b1, queen a3, bishop c4, you have to be aware that you grabbed some material for, uh, that you uh, gave up some, some material for the initiative. This is Kasparov's concept of material versus quality versus time, and I myself prefer to have the material, uh, and I want to defend a pawn up and try to wriggle my king out of danger. Uh, Mihal Tal obviously liked to attack, so he would uh, willingly give up a pawn if he could create something. And in this position, in this exact position, from the modern defense, the, the development is very superior for white, and black has to be extra care careful. Taking a pawn on b2 uh, requires very precise play. What can we learn from Tal's play? Uh, he didn't rush to attack. First he castled. After e6, uh, which is a bad move, he didn't continue opening up lines, sacrificing pieces. Rook f to e1. Before he started an attack, all of his pieces were in perfect square, so remember that. In some positions, such as the first uh, problem we saw here in the Sicilian, uh, after queen to c7, an immediate sacrifice was required. Sometimes you shouldn't do that. Sometimes you should bring more attackers into play. Okay, the next example is very funny. I, I wanted to show you that this is Reti versus Tartak Hour. Um, a very strange opening, uh, Karo Khan, and now after knight c3, uh, d4, knight e4, uh, Tartak Hour played knight f6, which is a theoretical move, and now knight f6, cf6 is the normal way to play. But after knight f6, Reti played queen d3, 
a move which I don't really like or understand because uh, black should play knight e4, queen e4, queen d5, bishop d3, queen takes, bishop takes, and black is basically equal. There's not much uh, white can do. So after bishop to d3, uh, Tartak however didn't play that. He played the move e5, which is a bad move. And now after d takes e5, queen a5 check, bishop to d2, queen takes e5, uh, Reti castled, setting up a huge trap. Uh, the king is castled and in safety, the black king is in the center. And I wanted to show you this game just to illustrate how dangerous it can be to leave your king in the center. Of course, uh, white's knight is hanging. And Tartakawa took the knight uh, with, the, with the knight, so he played knight takes e4. After knight takes e4, this is now a checkmate in three, in three moves with a wonderful queen sacrifice. Queen, takes, queen to d8 check, king to d8. King takes d8, bishop g5 check, king c7, bishop d8 checkmate. So be very careful. Um, this, this example I just wanted to show you to illustrate that if your opponent is giving away something when your king is in the center, be extra careful. This is a very funny example, not that, uh, not that instructional, but still fun to see. Uh, the last one is, uh, is very nice. Uh, this is Wei Yi versus N Hast from the Tata Steel Tournament 2015. Uh, in this position, and this was the Sicilian Paulsen, uh, this is still theory. Uh, there were 21 games from this position, the highest rated Rajabov Giri, Pormariov Malakov, Malahatko, I'm sorry. So what theoretical position? And Black's main move here is H4. Queen H3 still theory, B5. Aggressive, unnecessary, but black wants to play against the white king, of course, which is castled, and the black king is still in the center. And here, uh, Wei Yi played uh, in a way which the engines don't necessarily agree with, but same as uh, in the example we saw uh, from David Navara, it's very much justified and hard for a human to meet. f4, knight c4. This is the perfect square for the knight, and black actually often does this in the Sicilian. Uh, white gives up the bishop, but the thing is that uh, he gave up the bishop which didn't spend any time developing and the knight made a lot of moves, so white is now uh, severely up in development. f5, opening up the position. And this is very, very instructional because he didn't waste any time opening up the king and all of his moves uh, were aimed against the black king. He didn't, well, According to the engines, he, the engines, he wasn't precise, but I think it was fairly precise for a human. Bishop b7, trying to defend, rook h to f1. Once again, bringing his last piece into play. All of white's pieces are now in the attack. All of the pieces are conjoined together in an onslaught against the black king, while at the same time, the black pieces are completely out of play. He's playing with the queen and the bishop against two knights, a bishop, two rooks, and the queen. So, according to the engines, equal... But any human would, I think, take white. Now the engine actually thinks black is better after after e5. It changes its mind, so it doesn't really understand the position. Anhas did play e5, a very strong player, of course. Knight to b3. Queen to c7, uh, which I don't think was necessary. I think better was even to castle queenside because it looks too scary. King b1, safety first. And Wei Yi doesn't go for an attack wh when the situation isn't perfect yet. He, he waits until all of his pieces and his king are perfectly placed on the board and then he attacks. Rook c8, uh, probably going for some sacrifices on c3 if the queen moves and also threatening the c2 pawn if the queen moves f6 opening up the position and this was uh, rook to c8 was the key mistake here because it allowed f6 uh, knight f6 was the best move trying to prevent that and then it's slightly harder to open up the position probably bishop to e7 and castles would be survivable uh, castles long would also be a good move because the king is fairly well defended with all of these three pieces but after king b1 rook c8 uh, this allows f6, and now there's no way for black to prevent uh, the position from opening up. Probably Anne has thought that uh, after knight takes f6, way he wouldn't sacrifice, but she thought wrong. So knight takes f6, and now a very justified uh, pawn and an exchange sacrifice. Rook takes f6, gf6, bishop b6. A wonderful move and using the fact that white is threatening checkmate. So this all had to be calculated. f6 is the crucial move trying to open up the position, remove the defenders around the king. So knight takes f6, rook takes f6, g takes f6. 
And this now restricts the king from moving. There's no uh, moves for the king. Now bishop b6, if queen takes, of course, queen d7 checkmate. So after bishop b6, the queen has to keep the defense of the d7 pawn. So queen c6, the only logical move. Uh, knight to a5, once again, if queen takes bishop, checkmate. So queen to e6, trying to exchange the queens. And now knight takes b7, grabs the bishop. Now if you count the material, white has three pieces and the rook. Black has two rooks and the piece. So white is up in material now even. Okay, and now rook to b8 was played. I think that uh, black should have gone for a simple queen exchange and just take the queen and try to survive. Uh, and deal with the fact that your position is worse. But uh, she didn't play that. After knight xb7, rook b8 was played, and now knight d5, bringing another piece into play, just letting go of the knight. Rook to xb7, queen to c3, threatening a checkmate, of course. So queen c6, she has to defend. Knight takes f6. A very dangerous position she could have taken, uh, but if king takes f6, then queen c8. Uh, king e7, bishop c5. This is a mate in like 10 moves and really hard to defend. So after knight takes f6, she played king e7. And we have bishop d8, check, king e6, queen h3, and that's it. That's checkmate. So she actually got checkmated. But uh, the, the nice king hunts and checkmates are not that instructive. So let's return to where uh, this started happening. So h4 is still theory. Queen h3, still theory. b5, okay. f4. And if you play something else, if you try to play passively, if you allow black to create uh, her own attack, then your position is going to be equal. But way you wasted no time. So f4, tr threatening f5, opening up the position. Knight c4 takes, takes, f5. Now it's already very scary for the black king. And the engine thinks that white gave up his advantage, but I think... It's very hard to play for black, and I think that white is much better. Bishop b7, count the material, count the pieces playing. The fact that black has bishop, knight, and rook on the king side is completely irrelevant. Those pieces are not playing. Rook hf1, bringing all of his pieces next to the king. e5, knight b3, queen c7, king b1, the key move. Just getting your king out of harm's way completely. Now even any, any taking on c2 isn't checkmate. So yeah, okay, uh, these are the five, game, five games I wanted to show you. I prepared five more, but I wouldn't want this video to last for two hours. Uh, I hope these five were enough. Just remember that uh, sometimes when the king is in the center, it's crucial to find the immediate blow, as in the first game. So bishop takes c6 had to be played, otherwise the opportunity is gone. Uh, sometimes, like in Navarra, uh, uh, Mircea Emilian, you can actually prevent your opponent from castling. The, the move queen to c2 was, was perfect. So if you spot the opportunity during which your opponent hadn't castled yet, and you hadn't either, many people would just play castles because it's the most normal move. But keep your eyes open for opportunities like this. Keeping your, king, your opponent's king is in the center. Uh, the next example, I mean, just get all of your pieces into play. Mikhail Tal played this out perfectly. Use the fact that the opponent's king is in the center by bringing in reinforcements. The attack is going to come by itself. Uh, yeah, uh, this Reti Tarta cover is just a funny example of how things can go, go wrong. And Wei Yi, uh, Ein Hast is... Well, it's a very high-rated game and it's a theoretical opening. And I think that if you play against openings which often have a king in the center, which for example, the Paulsen or the Knight of Sicilian is. So if you are an E4 player, studying patterns like this one could help you identify weaknesses when the king is in the center and spot opportunities to strike. Okay, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for watching. Uh, I hope you liked the video on how to play against the uncastled king. Let me know what you think. Any feedback is greatly appreciated. And uh, stay tuned for more chess. See you later. Bye-bye.